Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Canada's first female Minister of Finance should be widely lauded, but it comes with the taint of the WE scandal and follows the resignation yesterday of Bill Morneau as both a minister and MP. APTN's Todd Lamarand has more on Prime Minister Trudeau's mini cabinet shuffle. Execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. So help me God. And with the signature, Christia Freeland replaced Bill Morneau as Finance Minister, while Dominic LeBlanc becomes Intergovernmental Minister. Freeland later talked about her priorities. The restart of our economy needs to be green. It also needs to be equitable. It needs to be inclusive. And we need to focus very much on jobs and growth. Morneau had resigned the day before, after a meeting with Prime Minister Trudeau. Both Morneau and Trudeau are being investigated by Ethics Commissioner Mario Dion over their roles in the WE charity scandal. But Morneau insisted stepping down was due to not wanting to run again. What I'm saying now is it's, it's appropriate for the Prime Minister to find someone with a longer term uh, approach to being Finance Minister that I can give since I'm not going to run again for a federal office. Trudeau did not directly answer if he tried to refuse Morneau's resignation. As we look to this next phase of rebuilding the Canadian economy uh, in the coming year and the coming years, uh, we need a team that is focused on the future. Uh, it has been a privilege to work with Bill and I wish him all the very best in the coming years. Uh, but I'm excited about the work uh, that the team is going to have in front of us in the coming months and years. Fair. Trudeau also announced today that Parliament is prorogued. It will resume in the fall with a new throne speech, whereas minority government could fall under a successful non-confidence motion by the opposition. He called his pre-COVID government's priorities out of date. We need to reset the approach of this government for a recovery, to build back better. And those are big, important decisions. And we need to present that to Parliament and gain the confidence of Parliament to move forward on this ambitious plan. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh deflected when asked if he'd support a vote of no confidence and force an election in the fall. Our focus is on how can we get help to people. If the Liberal government continues to focus on helping their close friends instead of helping people, if they continue to be caught up in fighting themselves instead of helping families that are worried about the future, then we'll have to look at all options. The throne speech is scheduled for September 23rd. Todd Lamarand, APTN National News, Ottawa. Earlier today, we spoke with National Chief Perry Bellegarde to get his thoughts on the new finance minister and the proroguing of Parliament. National Chief, thanks for being with us. Uh, first of all, what was your and the AFN's reaction to Bill Morneau's sudden resignation? Well, again, it's uh, something internal to the Liberal Party and the government here. Uh, but I said, we've got to work with whoever gets appointed to these key positions. Um, you, we lift up and acknowledge uh, uh, Bill Morneau, I used to call him Sunia Ogimau, the big money chief, you know, because over the last uh, number of years, there was 21.4 billion investments to First Nations people uh, to help close the socioeconomic gap. So it was moving in the right direction, but still more needs to be done. With that in mind, how do you feel about the Prime Minister's choice of Christian Friedland as the new finance minister? I, I'm quite excited about that. You know, the first uh, female uh, minister of finance in Canada's history. Uh, I have a good rapport and a good relationship with uh, Minister Christia Freeland. Uh, you know, we work together on the uh, the USMCA, the, the the new NAFTA. Uh, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and she's really familiarized with First Nations people and issues uh, through that process. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to working with her to make sure that um, you know there's going to be a new throne speech. So we have to advocate for priorities again for First Nations people, which are really Canada's issues as well. Once you make continued investments in education and water and housing and infrastructure, those are key things. So I, I, I applaud. I think it was a great choice. Uh, Christia will be a steady, calm hand, especially dealing with all the issues we've got to deal with in uh, post-COVID-19 about kickstarting the economy and dealing with the high unemployment rates and the businesses closing. So um, she's an excellent choice uh, to bring that calm and steadiness that's required. Like you say, there's a lot to deal with here. What do you think of the Prime Minister's decision to prorogue Parliament until the fall? 
Well, again, it's a minority government. Uh, you know, I don't know the uh, the discussions around cabinet table or the inner workings there. Uh, at the Assembly of First Nations, our job is to influence uh, the throne speech, influence the financial budgeting cycle, to make sure that rights, title, and jurisdiction are recognized and respected, uh, to always continually push for new policy programs and our legislation that respects First Nations jurisdiction, Aboriginal treaty rights, and our title, and uh, push for, for institutions that uh, speak to treaty implementation. And uh, I think back to the last throne speech, uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to Indigenous issues, you know, and it's, it spoke to the importance of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a priority for legislation, uh, re-establishment the National Treaty Commissioner to finally implement our treaties according to the spirit and intent, uh, missing murdered Indigenous women and girls, the action plan that's needed, uh, closing the infrastructure gap by 2030, um, suicide, dealing with mental health, mm -hmm. and full implementation of C-91, the language bill, and C-92, the child welfare bill. So strong things in the throne speech. Uh, we have to work extremely hard now to make sure those priorities aren't lost in the next throne speech. Proroguing Parliament's never a popular decision, and with a new throne speech plan for the fall, are you confident this minority government will be able to survive? Okay, we don't know what the future will bring, bring when it comes to uh, a minority government. You know, there's so much things at play. Um, our job at the Assembly of the First Nations is to make sure that our issues aren't sidetracked, aren't forgotten, and aren't put to the side. Uh, we need to close the gap that exists between First Nations people and the rest of Canadians. And once you start closing the gap, it's not only good for our people, it's good for Canada. You're building a better country. Uh, I've always said, if you can invest in the fastest growing segment of Canada's population in education training for young First Nations men and women, we'll have, have a huge return on investment to Canada's overall growth in GDP. So we've got to keep the, the pressure on and the focus on. You're going to build a better country that way. A long time promise has been a government-sponsored UNDRIP bill. It always seems like it's in the background, but uh, with everything that's going on, do you think we're going to see that tabled anytime soon? Well, again, that was, uh, we've always said the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is the roadmap to re reconciliation in Canada, and uh, it will create economic stability. And so our job is to put pressure on government to make sure that that bill is realized, and I've said two key words. It's royal assent. To me, it doesn't matter if it's introduced for first reading. It needs to achieve royal assent, and it needs to build upon uh, the previous uh, private member's bill, Bill C-262, as the minimum, and build upon that to strengthen it going forward. National Chief Barry Bellegarde, we'll have to leave it there, but appreciate you taking some time for us. Thanks for the opportunity. Over the weekend, a cabin belonging to a Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief burned down. The cabin was along a contested forest service road near Houston, B.C. Clan members are calling it arson, and RCMP say they are investigating. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. I think they should replace this. In a video posted on social media, Wet'suwet'en chief Kastewe is disheartened after arriving to see his cabin smoldering in ashes. It served as a meeting place for clan members. Located on the 27 kilometer mark on the Morris West Forest Service Road, it was a site used by the Wet'suwet'en and their supporters. Earlier this year, when RCMP were enforcing the injunction for Coastal Gas Link to operate. On Saturday, August 15th, Gestewe and his wife were on a trip when they came across the police with the site closed off. I said, what happened? What's going on here? I said, this is my territory, that's my cabins. And they said there was an arson or something. And they said that they got a call at 9 o'clock in the morning about that fire. Gidimden Access Point spokesperson Molly Wickham believes this is arson. Wickham says before this incident, members were facing hostility because of their opposition to the natural gas pipeline. A few weeks ago, there were people that were driving by Gidimden Checkpoint and shooting rifles off. Um, there are many vehicles that come by and throw garbage out the window at the camp, you know, at people that are out, out you know, in the camp. An RCMP spokesperson responded to APTN in an email stating an investigation is ongoing. Houston Detachment frontline members in the Regional General Investigation Section were called to the scene to assist in an investigation. The Forensic Identification Section was also called to the scene to process any evidence gathered in the area. 
Houston RCMP has conduct of the investigation and it remains ongoing. Gustaway says the cabin burning down reminds him of the 1950s when his parents' house burned down in Smithers and they had to relocate. The house was the first one to be burnt around 1953. And then they burned all the other houses down just so they could have that land. Ginnam Den members are in discussions about building a new meeting place and they want people to know they are still here in the territory protecting their rights. What we're fighting for right now is so our grandkids don't have to go through and great-grandkids don't have to go through what we're going through. Uh, fighting for our land, for our rivers, our wildlife. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Houston. A police watchdog is looking into that arrest in Nunavut caught on camera. That story more coming up. Stick around. Here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Showers and 24 for St. John's, 26 in Halifax, 15 in Nain, 14 with showers for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Showers and 22 for Montreal and Quebec City, 24 in Toronto. 23 for Ottawa. 22 with showers in Thunder Bay, 23 and rain in Sioux Lookout. 22 under the sun for Churchill, 23 and sunny for Norway House. Hot and 33 in Winnipeg, 1 degree warmer for Brandon. 34 in Regina and Swift Current, 35 for Estevan. 19 in Stony Rapids, 21 in Uranium City. A group of First Nations in northern Manitoba are scouring land and water to find a young girl who has been missing for about a month. 16-year-old Tammy Nataway has was last seen on July 20th in her community of Garden Hill First Nation. RCMP say Nataway may have been trying to get to the neighboring communities of St. Teresa Point or Wasagamack First Nations. Those three along with Red Sucker Lake make up the remote fly-in only Island Lake region. The communities have been searching nearby forested areas in the water daily. Island Lake Child and Family Services is offering a $5,000 reward for any information on the location of Nataway. Those with information are asked to contact RCMP or Garden Hill Band Constables. The man convicted of manslaughter in the death of 19-month-old Anthony Rain in 2017 has been sentenced in an Edmonton court. APTN's Chris Stewart watched the proceedings and has this update. 19-month-old Anthony Rain's beaten body was found by a passerby in the spring of 2017 outside the Good Shepherd Anglican Church. An autopsy of Anthony found a skull fracture, brain injuries, cuts and bruises across his body. He was malnourished. Tasha Mack and Joey Cryer were convicted of manslaughter in Anthony's death. In June, Mack, who was Cryer's girlfriend, was sentenced to eight and a half years. This afternoon, Justice David Lambrance sentenced Joey Cryer to nine and a half years prison. Both the prosecution and defense recommended this sentence. Judge Lambrance said he paid attention to the Gladue report, which showed Cryer had a history of alcohol and drug abuse, and that he was a sexual assault victim as a child. He is from the Samson Cree Nation. The judge allowed a 2.5 to 1 time served for Cryer due to his hardship in custody. Cryer had urine and feces thrown into his cell and he was physically attacked at least once. With the 6.5 years of time served, he will serve an additional three years behind bars. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. A violent arrest caught on video in a small Nunavut community will be reviewed by the RCMP's top civilian oversight committee. The video was shot in Kingai, Nunavut, previously known as Cape Dorset on June 1st. RCMP striked the man with a moving truck door before delivering knee strikes to him on the ground. The man was later beaten by his cellmate and flown to Callowit for medical care. He was released without charge. Now the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission for the RCMP has announced their own review of the incident, which is expected to wrap up within a year. 
A Pegasus First Nation man is receiving high honors from a Manitoba organization. Details after the break. Here's a look at the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Sunny in 26 in Fort McMurray, 23 with showers for Fort Chip. 34 in Medicine Hat, 26 and sunny in Edmonton. 24 for Vancouver, 23 with the sun out for Victoria. 22 in Fort Nelson, 24 and sunny for Prince George. 21 in Old Crow, 17 with showers for Whitehorse and Watson Lake. Showers and 17 as well for Yellowknife and Wrigley. 20 in Norman Wells. 7 in Saks Harbor. 9 in Politak. 7 for Repulse Bay. 14 for Baker Lake and Whale Cove. 7 in Aglulik. 6 in Joe Haven. Welcome back. The first Arctic University in Canada is getting ready to welcome its first group of students. With the new fall semester around the corner, APTN Sarah Connors met with the Yukon University's first president to see what his plans are for the school. Meet Mike DeGagne, the new president of Yukon University. In May of this year, Yukon College became Yukon University, making it the first northern university in Canada. Degonier will be its first president, as well as the first Indigenous president to join its ranks. It's a wonderful uh, time to be a part of this. The, um, the university is uh, an opportunity for the Yukon to really take, uh, take charge of its sort of research and, uh, uh, and of course, you know, all the training and skills development that we expect of, of, uh, of a university here for, for this territory, but also sort of to welcome the rest of Canada. Originally from Anamaki Wazing, 37 First Nation in Ontario, Degonye is Ojibwe and has a PhD in education. He previously served as the founding executive director of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Explore your future. Before and coming to right Yukon University, he was the president of Nipissing University in Ontario. During his seven term tenure, he took a leading role in indigenizing Nipissing's role in the post secondary sector. Degonye stepped down from Nipissing this year to focus on new ventures and says he plans to use his background to further Yukon University's success, especially its First Nations students. Yukon First Nations have a real stake in this community, in this, in this university. And so uh, we've worked with them for, for a long time now to help define what programs we need to offer, uh, sometimes how those programs are offered and how um, Indigenous knowledge is, is used in, in the university setting, the college setting. So. I think it's important that uh, Yukon First Nations continue to see this place as a, a place of partnership and engagement with them. Degania says one of the first tasks on his agenda as president is meeting with First Nations communities to better understand their educational needs. It's a good way for them, uh, for communities to see that we're serious about, about listening to what their needs are. And I think it's also important for, for, for me and for others to better understand what the communities are, are thinking in terms of their own research. While most of the university's classes will be online this year, Degonye says he's still excited for what's to come of Canada's first university north of 60. This is going to be a resource not only for the people here, Yukon First Nations and Northerners, but a, a Canadian resource. And I think it's uh, an opportunity to open up the territory to a lot of people who have never been here. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. The Manitoba Arts Council has awarded their award of distinction to Alan Grey Eyes. Grey Eyes from Peguis First Nation is a prominent figure throughout the Indigenous music scene in Manitoba and across Canada. Daryl Stranger spoke with Grey Eyes earlier today about the award. It's pretty humbling and pretty overwhelming. I gotta be honest, I'm not used to being in the spotlight, so receiving this award is a little scary as well. Alan Grey Eyes has been a part of the Indigenous music industry for over a decade, and he's done a lot for musicians and the public over the years. For example, he established the Sakahiwe Festival, formerly known as Aboriginal Music Week, which aims to make music accessible to less fortunate Indigenous families in Winnipeg. 
He also helped launch the Manitou Abe Festival, the Indigenous Music Awards, and he is on the board for the Indigenous and Rap category for the Junos. I think it's really important to um, acknowledge that uh, Alan is doing fantastic work on behalf of all Manitobans, but really for the Indigenous community in Manitoba, we can see the... Um, the incredible behind the scenes work that he's doing to and it, it certainly doesn't appear he's doing it for himself he's doing it for others and for for his community so that is a really exciting thing to honor and value gray eye says the award is nice to receive but he is not after the recognition for the work he does it's not important at all i think like i gotta do stuff because or, i like the idea of doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and not because it's going to get me recognition or facebook lights or or engagement on social media gray eyes also represents indigenous talent like kaylee cardinal Cardinal is the 2020 Juno winner for the Indigenous Artist of the Year. She says without Grey Eyes' help, she does not know where she would be today. I would say that like working with him, it's just been absolutely life-changing for me. He's um, he's not only like supported me so much with grants, but he's also like he's just so he's so hyper aware of all the very important details, which are things that I tend to skip over often. So it's been like. It's been a really beautiful relationship for me, and it's been um, a way for me to kind of... I've learned a lot from him. International recognition for Indigenous music is next on Grey Eyes Mind. Uh, hopefully when the pandemic lets up and things start to get better um, for audiences and our artists, uh, we'll be doing some, um, some concerts in Paris. And I'm also working with the High Commission in London, England on some... Uh, more streaming concerts and so they're going to be helping us on the ground um, engaging audiences over there and sharing um, some of the incredible uh, music coming out of the indigenous music community here in Canada. Daryl Stranger, EP10 National News, Winnipeg. Our congrats to Alan. And before we leave you tonight, farmers in Australia are turning to technology to hack one of the world's oldest professions with just the lift of a finger. Some ranchers are using drones to help round up their cattle herds. Normally it takes at least three people on ATVs to herd a group of a thousand cattle, but a drone can reduce operations down to one person. Farmers say the drones will make operations more efficient and safer without replacing jobs on the ground. And that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For more, including the latest on the situation in Caledonia, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.